the problem we are discussing is how or why uh, did these languages become dispersed over such uh, a widespread area? How or why did languages uh, sprung from some common source, uh, as Sir William Jones uh, put it? Uh, how did they get to have this remarkably widespread distribution? Before we go into it, I just want to talk a little bit about the significance of this topic. Indo-European language is by far the world's largest language family by number of speakers and by political importance found over much of the world. And it is ideologically freighted like nothing else. Uh, war of ideas, yes indeed, because Nazi ideology was based very heavily on the idea of the Nordics who were the early Indo-Europeans, the so-called Nordic race. And if you think this is gone, now let's move on to what is new uh, about this uh, lecture, and that is the impact of ancient DNA. And as I said at the beginning, uh, this is something uh, that has really only hit us <coughs> over the past three or four years. That so-called beaker people seem to replace the, the Neolithic farmers by wholesale replacement of the existing population uh, through violence. I'm sort of struck dumb by this. I had no idea. Yeah. Does that mean that both you and I are beakers? Um, in some ways, yeah. So um, it's likely that uh, a very large proportion of your genome, 70% can be traced back to that beaker migration event, that migration event that um, occurred about four and a half thousand years ago. Did the civilization of ancient China arise in isolation? Or was there an unremembered link with the cultures of the West? Now the echoes of voices long silent are offering startling testimony. Visitors' attention is drawn to the fabric wrapping the tiny body. It was not made by the Chinese, who hadn't yet acquired the craft of weaving wool with such sophistication. Where did the little boy come from? And very fair haired too. Mm -hmm. Almost if you, reddish. If you actually look at the profile, um, the nose is quite large and long. And the long nose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. although at this age we wouldn't really want to say much about ethnic affiliation. There is no uncertainty about the ethnic origins of the body buried in the main chamber below the other two. This perfectly preserved mummy was a woman of about 40. It's a European type of person. So she's quite tall. She's uh, 1.72 meters. I was startled. I was holding the most beautiful woman on earth. If she were alive today, or if I were alive 3,000 years ago, I would certainly make her my wife. But how could a Chinese man like Mr. Huff have met a blonde woman 3,000 years ago? According to many scholars and predominant Chinese belief, China's civilization was essentially evolving in isolation from the West. Though it concerns a distant past, the question resonates in the present. The intention of this video is to suggest that the Indo-European expansion was probably the most important event in human history. The original Proto-Indo-Europeans were a group of very warlike people that are thought to have originated somewhere in southern Russia and the Ukraine about 6,000 years ago. Genetically, modern Northern European people are the closest descendants. 
Northern Europeans are up to 60% genetically descended from the original Yamanaya Indo-European tribes that originated from southern Russia and the Ukraine. We've only known this since a series of studies from Harvard in 2015 that analysed the DNA of ancient Europeans. A further study in 2017 suggested that 90% of the British population was replaced by the Indo-European Balbika people in around 2500 BC. A study in 2018 analysing the DNA of ancient people on the Indian subcontinent showed conclusively that an Indo-European invasion originating from the corded work culture in Northern Europe took place around 2000 BC. These groundbreaking studies have completely changed the established thought on the Indo-European phenomenon. The Indo-European expansion began about 4000 BC and by 1500 BC the Indo-Europeans dominated a territory ranging from Ireland to Western China, a range of 4000 miles approximately. Conquering and replacing the population of Northern Europe whilst conquering and dominating most of Southern Europe, the Middle East, Northern India and Western China. Today 42% of the human population speak an Indo-European language as a first language. The BBC did a documentary earlier this year called Invasion, which was on the back of these recent DNA studies. It's surprising that the BBC even touched on the issue, as Indo-Europeans are what people used to refer to as Aryans, and Aryanism was central to the ideology of the Nazi party. Now, Aryanism was a pseudo science, it had a sort of mythical element to it, but it was based on the idea that the spread of Indo-European languages resulted from large-scale migrations and widespread domination of established populations by a group of Nordic type people. And this underlying idea of the ideology has basically been proven correct by the recent DNA studies. However, the cultural warriors at the BBC, believing that any number of perspectives can be taken from a point of fact, uses these recent DNA revelations to purport a pro mass immigration or multiculturalist narrative generation over the centuries has felt that it's the last to be truly British because it's on to this existential threat from the invasion of migrants. Was there ever a true British people? Does such a thing exist? I mean, this is a classic immigrant nation. The immigration started so long ago, it's not part of our popular narrative anymore. It's just a question of how long ago your ancestors yeah. came. The narrative basically goes invasion and population replacements have occurred throughout British history and of course therefore modern mass immigration or multiculturalism is part of our identity and is what defines us as a nation. Or simply put, we are all immigrants. I believe that the genetic and cultural influences of the Indo-Europeans have played the single most important role in determining who we are and in determining the development of Western civilization in general. So they are fundamental in understanding our history and informing our sense of identity. So what more do we know about the early Indo-Europeans? They both farmed and raised cattle. The cow played a paramount role both in daily life and in religion. They are thought to have been the first people to have domesticated the horse and developed the warrior chariot. This may not be true, but it seems that they were the first people to have used them on a mass scale. They practiced epic poetry using stock phrases, some of which show up in poetry that has been preserved to this day, such as the Iliad and Riga Verda. Excavated remains of Indo-Europeans were found to be less affected by disease, generally taller and broader than the prior inhabitants. They were thought to have had a unique military organizational structure. It involved a class of military specialists whose prime purpose was to fight. The practice of comitas is seen as an Indo-European concept that predates Roman times. It was practiced in Indo-European societies ranging from Western Europe to China. A comitas was formed when one of the leading men announced that he would need followers to accompany him on a foray into enemy territory. Those who were attracted by the proposal would volunteer their services in return for material reward and will only continue to offer their services to a particular leader if they were successful. Therefore, military leaders were selected on the basis of merit rather than anything else. Where did they come from exactly? I'm alright, I'm alright. What did he say? He asked to know why you're here. Ask him where they're from. What are you doing? 
Archaeological evidence would suggest near eastern origin in southern Russia and the Ukraine. It is likely that the Indo-European language developed in or near this region, although there is still a lot of uncertainty over this. I intend to point out later in the video that although the exact origin of the Indo-Europeans is still uncertain, the epicentre of the greater Indo-European expansion centred around Northern Europe, and it was Northern Europeans in this region that evolved the genetic edge that gave way to the Indo-European expansion that reached as far as India and Western China. The earliest historical text recording Indo-European people is possibly from clay tablets dating back to 2000 BC in ancient Sumeria which refer to the Gultians who invaded Sumeria. Although it's long been debated as, whether, as to whether the Gultians were Indo-Europeans, there is some evidence to suggest that they were. The earliest written Indo-European language was Hittite, and there is no dispute as to whether Hittite, the Hittites were Indo-European. Hittites were the masters of the central Anatolian region. Indo-European was the imperial language of the empire, whose inhabitants mainly, mainly consisted of non-Indo-European speakers. Evidence of clay tablets up to 4,000 years old suggests that they were a dominant class of Indo-European speakers ruling over and native uh, inhabitants. It was uh, uh, Rosny, uh, the, uh, um, the Czech scholar, uh, who in around 1920 uh, deciphered uh, Hittite and realized uh, that uh, it uh, is indeed uh, an Indo-European language. He was able to uh, come to uh, translate Hittite really quite successfully. And here is uh, uh, one of the uh, figures of a Hittite warrior. And uh, here is uh, uh, an inscription uh, in uh, a hieroglyphic Hittite, uh, 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 an inscription in the Luvian language, uh, which is one of the languages uh, of um, uh, ancient Anatolia, one of the uh, Indo-European languages of ancient Anatolia. Indo-Europeans invaded the island of Crete, establishing the Minoan civilization, which is thought to be Europe's first advanced civilization. He found tablets also like one that you see here in the Minoan Linear B script, uh, and that was with the great decipherment of uh, Ventris and Chadwick in the 1950s, uh, uh, revealed to be Mycenaean Greek. So the Linear B uh, uh, script uh, records uh, the Mycenaean Greek language, which indeed is an early form of the Greek language, which is, of course, a member of the Indo-European family. Indo-Europeans arrived in Greece around 1600 BC, establishing Myc Mycenaean civilization, which later gave way to the ancient Greek city-states such as Athens and Sparta. The mainland of Greece was a cultural backwater, but after 1600 BC, the archaeological re records suddenly portray a military aristocracy made up of men who had an av above average height and were robustly built. The ethnic description of, it, of this Indo-European military aristocracy is made very clear in the ancient Greek writings and mythologies. The references to Norbit type features of ancient Greek gods and heroes of the literature would suggest that either the ancient Greeks themselves were of this appearance or for some reason idealised these ethnic features. The Indo-Europeans arrived in India around 1600 BC and established Hinduism, which shared strong similarities with other Indo-European religions. The religion expels a very negative view of the indigenous Indians and was clearly used as a means of maintaining the domination of Indo-Europeans over the native inhabitants of India. The colour system of the Rig Veda is the precursor to the modern Indian caste system. The ruling BJP party of India has part of its party doctrine that the Indo-Europeans originated from India. Most archaeologists and geneticists don't take this seriously. The simple reason as to why the idea is almost certainly wrong is the fact that no Dravidian or Southern Indian DNA exists outside of the Indian subcontinent. A study published in March this year called The Genomic Formation of South and Central Asia is the first major publication to confirm that there was an Indo-European migration into Northern India. Not only does the paper confirm that there was a large Indo-European migration into the Indian subcontinent, it also suggests that the genetic composition of, a, of invading Indo-Europeans was nearly identical to the Europeans of the corded work culture in Northern Europe. The paper also shows that the descendants of the Brahmin or priestly caste in India still 
to this day have a much higher amount of in European DNA. The Tarkarians were a group of Indo-Europeans that developed large agricultural communities about 2000 BC in the Tarim Basin of Western China. They had a written language, Tarkarian, which is the oldest Indo-European language and its closest relatives are Germanic and Celtic languages. The farming settlements were based in completely barren deserts, but the surrounding mountains fed streams which had been altered by human activity to create oases which supported intensive agriculture and communities of steadily increasing sophistication. Crops such as wheat and barley were brought from the west and for the first time cultivated in the Far East. They are thought to have brought the wheel, agricultural techniques, the domesticated horse and advanced textiles to ancient China. Numerous well-preserved mummies dating from 1800 BC were found on the eastern edge of the Tarim Basin. They are Caucasianoid with most tending to have red or light coloured hair. The agricultural communities developed into large city-states, the largest of which were Kushna with 81,000 inhabitants and Agni with 32,000. Overshadowed by nomadic people to the north and Chi the Chinese Empire to the east, from the 9th century AD the people of the Oasis intermixed with the Yurgas, a Turkic people, and reverted to the Urgal language. What was the cause of this historically unprecedented expansion of people? Well, they certainly had some advantages, such as a domesticated horse, which allowed them to cover large distances, there's the warrior chariot, their military organisation, and the fact that they were pastoralists, which allowed a sort of mobile food source. But if they were so successful, what would have stopped other groups from copying their way of life, such as riding horses and raising cattle? Indo-Europeans must have had some kind of edge, and in order to expand it again and again over millennia, they had to have an edge that was hard to copy. Did they have some sort of genetic advantage over other groups? I think this is the case. A genetic advantage would have been impossible to copy by other groups, and would serve to explain how the Indo-Europeans maintained their competitive edge over the other groups for thousands of years. What evidence is there that Indo-Europeans held a genetic advantage over other groups? There's consistent evidence that shows that they were tall, on average three inches taller than the old European Neolithic farmers. There's evidence that shows that they were less susceptible to disease and had larger skull sizes than the Neolithic farmers from the Middle East. These three observable differences between the Indo-Europeans and other groups can all be explained by better nutrition. If we look to the expansion of the Neolithic farmers that preceded the Indo-European invasion, this was clearly a result of the uptake of farming, which would have allowed a greater calorie intake per acre inherited, a larger, allowing a larger population size to be sustained. But all this came with a massive trade-off of nutrient deficiency. A diet made of grains lacked essential nutrients that would have been previously available through a meat-based diet. As a result of this, archaeological remains show a significant decline in head size in Europe after the Neolithic farming expansion and a marked decrease in height. The high level of dependence on cattle farming was a big difference between the diet of the Neolithic farmers and the Indo-Europeans. However, there were many other ethno-linguistic groups in Asia, Eurasia and elsewhere that were also pastoralist cattle herders. Why would it be the case that one group was able to be so successful and not the others? Perhaps there was something unusual about the Indo-Europeans. And there was a genetic mutation, the European lactose tolerance mutation. The, U the European lactose tolerance mutation was the first found in human remains in Germany 5,000 years BC. This allowed adult humans to digest lactose, which is the sugar found in milk. <clears throat> Prior to the existence of this gene, drinking milk would make adult humans sick. The rapid spread of this lactose tolerance mutation can be seen throughout Europe from 5,000 years BC, when the lactase persistent ileum became common so that, a fair, so that a majority of the population could drink milk. A new kind of pastoralism became possible, one in which people came, kept cattle primarily for their milk rather than for their flesh. This change is very significant because dairy produces about five times as many calories per acre. This type of pastoralism allowed more and better quality food, giving way to better health and disease resistance, improved intelligence, decreased mortality rates, faster population expansions. In 
A 2004 study researchers estimated that people with this mutation would have produced up to 19% more fertile offspring than those who lacked it. Combined with the warlike culture, more than likely a result of living a pastoral lifestyle, the increasing returns to scale from pastoral farming necessitating a non-relenting demand for more land. I think this gives us a good idea of what gave rise to the Indo-European expansion. <clears throat> the existence of the Indo-European European lactose tolerance mutation can be seen in varying degrees today along the path of the Indo-European expansion. There are three different lactose tolerance mutations that arose independently of each other. The oldest and most widespread being the European lactose tolerance mutation, and then there's a West Africa that's found solely in West Africa and a Saudi Arabian mutation found in some parts of the Middle East and East Africa. The concentration of lactose tolerance that you can see in Northern India is due to the European lactose tolerance mutation. This brings us to a very important point, the origin of the greater Indo-European expansion into India, Western China and into Southern Europe and into Anatolia was from Northern Europe had a northern European origin. It was Europeans in this region that evolved the genetic edge that gave way to the greater expansion. The recent DNA studies have shown that far-flung populations of Indo-Europeans in India and Western China descended from a European population that not only has Yamanaya DNA but also all the Western hunter-gatherer and Neolithic farming DNA of the northern Europeans. An explanation for this can possibly be taken from observing the rate at which lactose tolerance genes spread within the Indo-European population. In the available literature, there is still quite a lot of uncertainty about the origin of this mutation and the strength and timing of selection. I haven't been able to find any studies that provide a timeline of the spread of the lactose tolerance mutation using ancient DNA samples. However, the age and rate at which the gene spread can be estimated using modern DNA. A 2004 study estimates that strong selection for the lactose tolerance mutation occurred in Northern Europe within the past five to 10,000 years. Generally, you can split the life cycle of selected islands into two parts. First, phase one, when it is at low frequency, there is a lot of stochasticity in its trajectory, indeed has a roughly a 50% chance it will disappear. However, once it reaches a certain frequency, its trajectory will almost be deterministic and it will go into fixation relatively quickly. Phase two. The elevation of the curve, which represents the increase in the spread of the gene within the population, will be higher or lower depending on the selection advantage of the gene and whether or not the population is expanding or decreasing. The researchers of the 2004 study called the degree of selection for the European lactose tolerance mutation amongst the strongest ever yet seen in the human genome. The relative suddenness at which the lact lactose tolerance mutation could have become ubiquitous, ubiquitous in a, within a specific population in a particular locality would have led to a significant inequality in the possession of this most advantageous mutation. Therefore, it can be suggested that the Indo-Europeans of Northern Europe evolved the genetic edge over the group, other groups, including the original Yamanaya culture. Legacy of Individualism Is it possible that the early Indo-European way of life left a lasting genetic tendency towards favouring individualistic political and social views? The inheritability of political and social views is well studied and there are numerous studies confirming that our political views are 50-60% to 60 genetically inherited. As the graph shows, we can see a strong correlation between Northern European countries with the high percentage of Indo-European ancestry and a tendency to hold individualistic political views. These individualistic tendencies would have greatly benefited Indo-European cattle farmers. Cattle farming is not a particularly cooperative venture. Individual wealth could be acquired through expanding and safeguarding the herd, whilst cattle theft would have been commonplace. Therefore, a mindset of self-interest and individual responsibility would have been more advantageous than a tendency towards collectivism. Evidence of early Indo-European tendencies towards individualistic behaviour can be seen in their voluntary, free marketish military structure, their berserker warrior style and their poetry which emphasise the importance of individual glory. 
is it this tendency towards individual glory originating from the lifestyle of the early Indo-Europeans that is key in explaining the creative enthusiasms behind the triumph of Western civilization. The West has been characterized by persistent creativity from ancient to modern times across all fields of human thought and action. Within every generation, one finds individuals searching for new worlds, new religious visions, new styles of painting, architecture, music, science, philosophy, and literature in comparative contrast to non-Western countries where cultural outlooks tend to persist for long periods with only slight variations and revisions. In Charles Murray's book, <coughs> Human Accomplishment, The Pursuit of Excellence in the Arts and Sciences, it points out that 97% of accomplishments in the science occurred in Europe and North America from 800 BC to the 1950s. In a subsequent publication, it also points out that around 95% of all explorers in history were European. Can the roots of this creativity be traced back to the way of life of the Indo-Europeans?